there's always, it seems, another superhero movie coming out. And many of these are with familiar characters that you've seen before in other movies or other shows, specials, and comic books. And some are kind of off the beaten path. Some superheroes that you haven't heard of very often. And they could just be auxiliary to the series. Well, maybe there could be some new superheroes as well. I don't know how frequently you get new superheroes. Don't ask me. But I'm wondering if there was in the boardroom of the franchise saying, we got a new superhero. Someone says, oh, yeah, what's their power? Are they really strong? They have special strengths? And they say, no, this superhero is weak. Well, okay, this superhero have extra uh, intelligence. It's great. He's smart, right? He's a genius. Is that what makes him super? And they respond, no. This guy's uh, kind of dumb. Not very smart. Not strong. And they respond, well then, I guess this superhero must have wealth, right? He's got to have some means by which to affect change or fight evil. So he's, he's rich, right? And they say, no, he's, he's got nothing. He's poor. He's uh, unintelligent. Uh, poor weakling. I don't think we've seen that kind of superhero movie yet. And we may never. Because the world does not value weakness or poverty or foolishness. And yet, this is the thing that God uses to frustrate the wise and the strong and the wealthy. Important verse here from Jeremiah 9. This is what Paul alludes to when he concludes his argument and says, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. He's quoting from Jeremiah 9, which beautifully traces out these three things, the same as Paul did. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. We have in our God the word which saves human souls, the word of the cross, Whereby his steadfast love, God fulfills the righteous requirements of the law in the place of sinners who had failed. And by sanctifying them with the forgiveness of sins, he reconciles the world to himself. That is the power of God. And look how he does it. In what appears foolish to the world, what appears weak to the world, and what appears poor and impoverished to the world, he does so in the cross. The church's power, then, as we think about the real world that we live in, our church, or the church of your neighbors, of your friends, of your family, the church's power is what? It is neither wisdom. What we mean by this is that the church's power will never be a kind of intelligence. So, for example, when St. Paul was in Athens, Greece, that was the intellectual capital of the world, where philosophy and philosophers converged for uh, decades and perhaps centuries. And the philosophical conversations were endless, as everybody knew, quote, Greeks seek wisdom. The, the word philosophy is a Greek word meaning love of wisdom. Paul stood up there in Athens, and he made a speech as well. He talked about how God was going to judge the earth, and his listeners, as you can picture, nodded their heads, and they thought, yeah, this is, that's fair. God is going to judge the earth. Thank goodness. Until Paul said, he's going to judge the earth by a man whom he proved to you by raising him from the dead. And they went, <laughs> Ridiculous. It says they laughed at him. When he came to the part where God raised Jesus from the dead, they thought, well, well, we're done. This is not wise anymore. Why would you want to come back from the dead? 
Uh, it made no sense to them. They had no business with it. They laughed him off the stage. The world, as we learned, will not be attracted to Jesus Christ through the creation of effective slogans. The church can try this, but the world is not ultimately going to find eternal life because it has presented convincing TED Talks about these kind of things. Or if the church broadcasts persuasive explanations for why everyone should come to church, everyone should believe in Jesus, the world won't be impressed with our wisdom and our intelligence. For Christians who do have such a gift, it's important that you pursue those gifts. Do everything you can with your mind to sanctify your thoughts and to, and to, and to explain and reproduce those thoughts in other people's hearts and minds. But the church's power is not an intelligence. It's not a wisdom. It's just the word of the cross. Why does God give us intelligence then? He certainly gives us intelligence that we might put it to use for him, reflecting the teaching of the cross, to be in Bible study, to be memorizing his word with our intellect, to be interpreting it, implementing it for our lives, looking at this highly complex body of work that God gives us in his scriptures, and organize our thoughts according to it, and criticize, critique the world against it, and to plan a life around the truth of Christ. And if we're honest, we'll have to say we've not become as wise as we could have become. Because we have not put our minds to use in learning the word of God as much as we should have. Therefore, it is a relief that God's power does not depend on our wisdom. Our wisdom must increase in the word of the cross every day. The church's power is neither in strength. Now, when Jesus came into the temple that day, which we read, and he uh, did some things to upset the religious leaders, they responded to him and said, give us a sign to prove to us that you have the authority to be doing what you're doing. Demonstrate your power, they challenged him. Implying, you know, if you're not as strong as Moses, we're not going to listen to you. Moses brought us up out of Egypt with wonderful powers. And Jesus didn't show them any strength in return. In answer, he did not. He pointed to his own death, remember? He said, go ahead and destroy this temple. If that's how you care about God's house, destroy this temple. And I will rebuild it in three days. Referring to his cross and resurrection. The world continues to look for signs of God's power that we can see with our eyes or hear with our ears. And Christians fall prey to this thinking too when they believe that in order to fulfill God's mission, we have to, in some sense, Christianize our country. There's various ways people go about explaining what that means, but it seems that Christians are tempted to think that we can only have God's will come to pass if we have Christian representatives in halls of power. Or if uh, we raise up Christian rulers, establish Christian policy lobbies, or multiply internationally recognized church corporations. We think if we have power, if the church has power and strength, then that's when we'll know everything will be okay. Now, a lot of those things we do have to work toward because God has given us these muscles to put to use. But the church's power is not in strength. It's not in influence. It's not in people looking upon the church and saying, now oh, that's how you're supposed to do it. That was, real, that was really effective. That's, that's not how the church has its power. Certainly, though, Jesus does give us the strength that we do have, and we are to put it to use for his church, right? Remember what Jesus said when he told his disciples, look out there. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers out to his harvest. 
workers are needed. The strength of God's people is needed to exert and to invest in his church. One reason some churches ultimately can't keep going is the strength is sitting latent. The strength is not being put to use, but it's being put to use in other places. And it's a relief, therefore, that God's power does not depend on our strength. And this word, the cross, deserves that we redouble our efforts, redouble our energy into investing in God's kingdom. Wherever our circle of influence sits, put your strength there, knowing that the real power is in this word of the cross behind us. And thirdly, finally, the church's power is not in riches. You know what Jesus did when he came into the temple, right? I passed over it before, but let's go there. He spilled the coins of the money changers working there. He tipped over their tables. He pushed out the animals. I don't think that whip was used to actually hit anybody. It would make, make a sound, get the animals moving, right? Jesus was disrupting the marketplace that had, occur that had grown up in God's house. The temple had been corrupted by the thirst for money. God's church must not be corrupted for the thirst for money. Because riches, this is listed last, probably because it's the bottom of the rung of the ladder. It's the bottom of the barrel. Riches are not where God's power is found. You don't depend on wealth in order for God's salvation to be active and busy in the world. Put it this way. If the world does not appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus when a struggling congregation proclaims it, it's not going to appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus if a rich congregation proclaims it. It might appreciate something different, but it's not taking what God is truly holding out for their salvation. What the flesh values, what money can buy, what entertains people, what stirs our emotions, what tastes good, what, it, what feels good to sit on or lay on, is not what points people to heaven. Only the love of God as displayed in the blood of Christ for sinners is what enlightens people with the truth. Money continues to be a gift from God that is to be used for his purposes, but the church's power is not increased if it has more of it, nor is the church's power decreased if it has less, because the church's power is in what? The word of the cross, the power of God. And again, if we trust in the power of God, in the word of the cross, it is true, we ought to put our money where our mouth is, as it is said, and recognize that the church's workers, such as teachers or administrators or secretaries or preachers or servants, whoever it is that works for the church, they depend on the church, they depend on the preaching of the gospel for their, uh, for their income. And the world has a very low view of all these things, but we Christians, we must be cheerful givers that the church can take care of its workers. When that does not happen, we see what the effects are. Therefore, it is a relief to us that the church's power is ultimately not in riches, but is in the word of the cross. Therefore, we say that the Lord is our boast. We boast not in wisdom, nor in strength, nor in riches, but in the Lord who practices steadfast love and righteousness in the earth. This was true in the Old Testament as well. What did God do to practice steadfast love and righteousness in the earth? First, he created human beings. And when they fell into sin, he promised them a savior. Then he called Noah to rescue the human race through the ark. This was God's steadfast love and righteousness in the earth. And then he called Abraham to trust in him, to know that through him, through his descendants, the blessings of the world would come to pass. And so all these ways, again, in Egypt, when God frustrated the wise and the powerful nation of Egypt, he brought his people, weak and foolish as they were, into freedom. 
All along the way, we see God overturning the powers of the world for the sake of the promise of Christ who is to come. And it has now culminated, as we can now see in our time of history, that all of the Old Testament and the New is for Christ to take away the sins of the world upon the cross and be raised victorious, thus overturning the tables, flipping around the, the riches, the wealth, and the wisdom of the world. This is a great comfort for me, and I pray for you too. Because you will find in the hours of contrition, you are not strong enough. You are not wise enough. And even if you have some matter of wealth, it will do you no good at the gates of death. That is when the word of the cross sweeps in with its wings to lift you up and to say, yet you have Christ. He is your boast. He is the power who will make all things well for you. And it's in his name we commend ourselves and our church to that power. Amen. May the peace of Christ, which goes beyond all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds by faith and faith <coughs> unto eternal life. Amen. Let's stand now to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Dear Christians, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very.